Ladies and gentlemen, friends of the university, students, staff, alumni, it's great to welcome you this evening to what I think is now just about the 20th inaugural lecture in our first series this academic year. Um, and we have a special occasion today because today, for the first time, we have two inaugural lectures actually at the same time, not one after the other. We've had two on the same occasion before, but never two delivered actually at the same time. Now, I promise you that the two professors will not be speaking at the same time. Well, I don't think so. <laughs> but they will be delivering the lecture jointly, and, and that's uh, very exciting. And the, the lecture from Professor Scott Cable and Timothy Schmidt is entitled Chemistry with Laser Beams, Molecules in the Atmosphere, Interstellar Space, and solar energy, a great title, which explains why we have a full audience today. In welcoming you, I would like to start by acknowledging the Bejigal people, the traditional custodians of this land, and paying my respects to elders past and present. I also want to particularly welcome Tim and Scott's family, Scott's parents, James and Helen, um, his wife, Eleanor, and daughter, Susanna, you're very welcome. And Tim's parents, Philippa, Philip, Philippa, sorry, Philip and Janice, and um, Trent, Tim's brother, and Jessica, Tim's partner. You're all very welcome here for a, a great occasion. I also want to take the opportunity to introduce both of our inaugural professors to you, and I'm, I'm going to start with Scott, who joined UNSW on the 1st of January this year. He is currently the head of school. He um, did his undergraduate and postgraduate studies at Griffin, Griffith University in Brisbane. At that time, it was a very small student population, less than a 1,000. It's grown enormously since then, but he, he was a bit dodgy at the time. There were no computers, no one knew what he was doing. So he did another degree in management, a diploma in management at QIT in the evenings and got away with that. So he did two degrees at the same time. He went on to do postdoctoral work at Cornell University and then worked outside the academic sector at Procter & Gamble in London for a year. But he, he came back to the real world, back to university at the University of Sydney as a lecturer in 1991 and became a professor at the University of Sydney at the end of 2013 before we managed to coax him to come to UNSW. The right decision. His research is in the details of fine, computer, uh, fine quantum detail of chemical reactions. Um, and um, he's had an enormous number of publications, 130 journal articles two in science and one in nature chemistry in just the last two years. He has o had held over $12 million of research funding. He's had 53 PhD students. No, PhD and honours. PhD and honours students, okay. I thought 53 PhD students was pressing it even for you. Um, he's, he's a member of the College of Experts of the ARC, the Australian Research Council. He's on the board of the Royal Australian Chemical Institute. He's received all sorts of awards, including the Fulbright Senior Fellowship. Um, he's got teaching awards as well as research awards and many, many other honours. And we're very much looking forward to hearing your part of the lecture. You've given it now. <laughs> and um, Tim, Professor Tim Schmidt. Tim was born in Canberra. He was uh, raised in northwest Sydney. He went to James Roos Agricultural High School. Um, he, he represented Australia at the 1993 International Chemistry Olympiad. He got his degree from the University of Sydney. He won a, the uh, University Medal in Theoretical Chemistry. He then studied at Churchill College, Cambridge. He got a PhD from, from Cambridge for work on femtosecond dynamics of molecules in intense laser fields. His postdoctoral work was in Baal on the electronic spectroscopy of highly unsaturated hydrocarbons of astrophysical relevance. He also made the decision to come back to Australia to work at CERO on modelling of the Rubisco enzyme. Did I say that correctly? Yeah. I got away with that. 
He commenced as a lecturer in chemistry at the University of Sydney in 2004 and then progressed his way through the ranks at the University of Sydney again before making the great decision to come to UNSW where he is professor and ARC future fellow and in 2010, I should add, he received the Koblenz Award. He also has an enormous amount of grant income, $6.1 million I calculated currently, 122 peer review publications, many in really important journals like Energy and Environmental Science. And it's a great pleasure to welcome Tim and Scott to give us their lecture this evening entitled, to remind you, Chemistry with Laser Beams, Molecules in the Atmosphere, Interstellar Space and Solar Energy. The floor is yours. So we tossed a coin earlier and I won, so I'll start off this uh, little tag team that we have here. Thank you everyone for coming. I'm just delighted to see everyone here. Uh, as is the custom of these inaugural lectures, it's uh, part of life story, part of science story. So I'd like to introduce my direct family who's in the audience here. Ellie, my wife, Susanna, my daughter. It's in our holiday last year or the year before. Also in the audience are my parents, Jim and Helen, and for completeness, that's my brother and sister there as well. And just because I like this photo, I'll stick this one up as well. That's mum and dad at the age of 16 going on a date to the uh, Brisbane exhibition. So they've been together a long, long time. A little bit of the family history here. I'm showing you their parents. Hey, they look the same. <laughs> Peas in a pod, hey? <laughs> I'm showing you this because my two grandfathers were really uh, working men, tradesmen. My grandfather on dad's side has this uh, mechanics garage in Camp Hill, uh, which is the suburb I was born and brought up in. Mum's dad was a blacksmith and represented Australia in rugby league in the 1920s. The creative side of the family comes from mum herself, and I think this combination of creativity and working with your hands is what makes me love the science that I do right now, where we build our own instruments and we think about them in a lot of detail. If you follow the cables through, the cables have been in Australia for a long time, so this is now my great-grandfather, and I'll just branch the family tree here a little bit, because if you follow Henry Charlton cable back, then you get to the first fleet from Australia, Henry Cable and Susanna Holmes, were both convicts. They were both tried at the Old Bailey for uh, stealing goods uh, and sent to Australia for the sum of seven and 14 years, respectively. Uh, they actually met in prison. They had a baby in prison. <laughs> and the jailer uh, put them on the same boat, thankfully, coming out to Australia. And that was the boat, well, not quite. It was the friendship. I couldn't find a photo of the original friendship, so that's the Sydney Harbour Ferry, the friendship. <laughs> and two weeks after the first fleet landed, they got married. And they were in Australia's very first European marriage ceremony. And this is their mark in uh, St. Philip's Register, the church downtown. They were illiterate. They just wrote with a cross. In the same registry, a little later on, they've clearly learned to read and write, and they've signed their names here. It's Henry Cable and Susanna Cable. And the strange spelling of Susanna Cable here curses my daughter, right, for the rest of her life because she is spelled the same way. They have another claim to fame here. I don't know if there are any lawyers in the audience. Have we extended that far? Probably not. He Henry and Susanna, sorry, uh, were the litigants in Australia's very first civil lawsuit. They sued the captain of the ship for the sum of 15 pounds that he had taken. Uh, they were not allowed to have this lawsuit in England. Philip said, we're going to start again in Australia and allowed the convicts to sue the captain and they won. And he got his 15 pounds to start himself up in business, slaughtering whales and seals, I think. The other side of the family is a little bit more reputable here. We can follow through some noble families, the kings of England, the kings of Scotland. <laughs> so that makes me, this, this person here will become infamous as the talk goes on. So this is the uh, second Earl of Arran. But the first Earl of Arran is what I'd like to just reflect on for a minute. I am his 14th great-grandson. And there are some other people that also appear as his 14th great-granddaughter. <laughs> and that's 14th great-granddaughter. That's his tie. Yeah, that's Churchill a Churchill College. College tie. Yeah. Even through to America with FDR. <coughs> and 
from here, I, I think the family must, must go downhill because this person is my uh, great-grandson 14 times removed from the first Lord of Arran. Yeah, thanks, Scott. So we actually only discovered this in writing this lecture. It's not something that we talk about all the time. <laughs> but I think from, from what you can see here is probably every single person in this room is descended from, from this weirdo. Yeah, look, um, I'm just going to introduce my, my little things, the, the, the Schmitterlings. This is uh, the cutest picture I have of James. This one, I think, has even uh, caused new children to be born after showing this to, uh, to other couples. They get very clucky. Henry, uh, my youngest son, they've uh, grown up a bit since then. This is them uh, representing Glebe for the Glebe Greyhounds in the AFL during the uh, round to support Adam Goods. Henry there. Um, Jess, my partner, takes, uh, well, with me, uh, we, we take the kids to AFL during the winter. And Henry, Henry also likes to pull funny faces. Uh, and I, I wonder where he gets that sort of thing from. <laughs> um, my family who are, who are here, um, so we, we, we had our family home in the, in the suburbs of Sydney, out in the northwest. This is us back in the early 80s. I'm not sure if I got these dates right, but my, my father's from the New England region. Uh, so this is a backyard in Glen Ennis, 1979 or something. Uh, graduating at Sydney Uni. My brother and I were Cub Scouts. So this is very, very normal sort of suburban upbringing in Sydney and we all played soccer and it wasn't until I was preparing this talk that I, I noticed someone poking through <laughs> here in the, in, the, in the background of this photo. It's right, kind of brilliant. And so also um, in, 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 <laughs> in preparing this talk, Scott and I discovered we, we had a, a common ancestor in the 15th century, right? If we follow these characters down through, uh, you know, major to minor, more minor and minor aristocrats that come, 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 come down to us. But this is an interesting story as well. So in talking to Scott about his very early Australian uh, background, I, I was interested to, 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 to find out who was my earliest Australian ancestor. And I go back at least to a, a character called Richard Atkins. And if you look at the Australian Dictionary of Biography, it's not that, um, it's, it's not that flattering. Some things haven't changed. <laughs> but what's also interesting is uh, Atkins had a huge argument with MacArthur, and uh, Atkins basically won this because he was more connected. <laughs> um, and uh, MacArthur is, in fact, a direct ancestor of Scott's wife, so other things don't change. <laughs> we're, we're a diverse mob. This is just, even just on my dad's side. Um, for instance, here is uh, Anne, Anne Bocker, is one of the very first uh, Jewish immigrants to Australia, so she was the, the widow of a Jewish convict. Uh, and then she hooked up with Richard Atkins of the previous slide, and she died in childbirth. This guy lost everything <laughs> to his debts and gambling. Here I have a Portuguese ancestor as well, um, and the inevitable convict, right? So, uh, although, Scott, what did your guy steal? <laughs> the Old Bailey record says that he completely ransacked the house and even stole the ham out oh, of the pickling good. barrel. Well, this guy got 10 years for certain hams. <laughs> and I'm probably not the best cricketer in the family because if you follow this line down, you get to Adam Gilchrist, which I also found out yesterday. Um, there's a connection here with this, this sea captain, Captain Lee. If you do go reading the, the uh, Sydney Gazette in 1811, which I'm not sure you, you would do, but I'll, I'll do it for you, you'll find out that, that on a certain day, March 16, it looks like in 1811, uh, Captain Lee turns up with a ship full of grog from India. He used to run, do a booze run from Calcutta. And um, this, this newspaper says, everybody who has the right to go and get booze, go and see Captain Lee. And if you look at the, the list of the people who are licensed to go and collect booze, <laughs> this includes a certain Henry Cable from Windsor. So he's invested his 15 pounds into a booze business. If you look down here, the list of persons at Sydney licensed for brewing beer. Henry Cable again, and some other mug called James Squires. This clearly explains our Friday <laughs> afternoon beers, doesn't it? I think we've brewed a few beers together. We have. <laughs> um, of course, my, my surname is Schmidt, and I'll just mention that the Schmidts came to Australia in the mid-19th uh, century and set up uh, various jewellery businesses here in young New South Wales. That was my great-great-grandfather. Um, my great-grandfather and then my grandfather uh, set, up, set up a business in Glen Innes. My father broke the tradition and, and became a, a scientist. On my mother's side of the family, we have an Anzac. This is uh, my mum's great-grandfather, who was uh, pretty much blown up uh, four months after enlisting in World War I. OK. Back to Scott. So a little bit on the academic careers. We'll switch the uh, laser pointers here. 
So I went to, went to school in Brisbane. I'm a Brisbane boy through and through. Still an avid Queensland State of Origin supporter. Really enjoyed the grand final a couple of weeks ago, I must say. Um, so this is the family, all in school uniform in Brisbane. From there I went to, to Griffith Uni, enrolled in chemistry and physics. And there's maybe an educational lesson somewhere here. I was enrolled in a course in electrochemistry. My apologies to all the electrochemists. The Friday of week four. <laughs> Friday of week four was the last date for change of in, any enrollments, and there was an assignment due that Friday, and I just couldn't face doing the assignment. So I changed out of electrochemistry into this strange subject called molecular spectroscopy by a new lecturer at the university then, and my life has never been the same. So there's somewhere an educational lesson. Assessment drives behavior. That's one of them. And serendipity, I guess, is another one. So this is Ellie and I graduating at Griffith Uni. I did my PhD there as well under Alan Knight. And this nice is shorts. <laughs> uh, they're preserved somewhere, I'm sure. Although oh, no, under uh, Alan Knight uh, at Griffith Uni. Uh, from Griffith, I met up well, as a, a guest speaker by the name of Brad Moore, who was actually Tim and my common academic ancestor, if you trace the academic tree further back. And Brad Moore was doing this thing called uh, molecular dynamics or state-to-state -state photochemistry. And I went and joined Paul Houston at Cornell to study that field. This is the group photo at Cornell. And just interestingly, Paul will be here. He's just retired as Dean of Science at Georgia Tech, and he's going to be here in three weeks if anyone wants to meet up with him. And there I took my industrial sabbatical at Procter & Gamble for one year, retreated with my tail between my legs. Actually, I just loved research. I joined the University of Sydney in 1991 as a lecturer. And then someone also fell in love with molecular spectroscopy, I think, and Tim, for better or for worse, decided to do an honors uh, year you know, in my lab studying molecular spectroscopy. And just before I hand back to Tim, uh, life and science really do intertwine through all of our lives. So this is Alan Knight with my daughter, Susanna, and Paul Houston with Susanna, and Tim with Susanna, <laughs> and Les Field with Susanna. <laughs> <laughs> Are we racing babies or something there? <laughs> Is that Jesse or Jackie? Jesse. Okay, I'll hand back to Tim. So just, just a few words of my uh, academic background. So as, as has already been mentioned, I, I went to a proper state school, uh, James Roos. I actually did some agriculture there. I used to lead cattle at shows and so on. Uh, I was involved in this International Chemistry Olympiad, and that got me fired up about an, a, an academic career. Before that, I was pretty keen on being a vet, maybe a country vet. I liked all creatures great and small and all that stuff. I went to university. Um, early on, I was uh, interested in molecular biochemistry and such things, and by second year uni, I dropped maths and physics. Uh, but I was lured back to the physical end of, uh, of sciences, principally through interactions with uh, George and Scott, um, who you saw earlier. So um, at the end of uh, my undergrad at Sydney, I was lucky enough to get a scholarship to Cambridge, where, incidentally, you have to kneel before God to get your, your degree. Um, and Cambridge is, is, is a good place. Um, but one of the great things about Cambridge is you meet some extremely good people. And uh, Rob Sharp here will come up later in the talk. I used to run a bar with him. And uh, we, we might have drunk a lot. We drank all the profits, certainly. And uh, we talked a lot of science. And uh, now we, we still collaborate. In fact, all of that talk about astronomy was, became useful because the postdoc, uh, which, which I undertook, was at Basel um, with John Meyer. This is a good place for, for doing anything interstellar. You see that the, the residents of Basel even take on the form of aliens once a year. Um, and this is where, where we're going to start to talk about some science. So the, the science I did in Basel was all about identifying forms of carbon in the interstellar medium. And all of you have carbon atoms in your bodies, and you, I guess you know intellectually that they were formed in stars, right? But what happened to those carbon atoms between uh, the stars and their delivery? I like this picture because it's got, it's got crazy monkeys and humans and, and stuff. Carbon atoms are born here. They move around and are reincorporated into, into planetary systems. And at some point, life forms, right? So we were interested in, in, in the carbon here. And so 
When you go looking for carbon in the diffuse interstellar medium using optical spectroscopy, right, what you see are a whole bunch of absorption features. So this is wavelength. This is a, a bluish colored light. And if you disperse these wavelengths and look at the, at the light transmitted by the interstellar medium, you find that there are a whole bunch of things that absorb light in the interstellar medium. I mean, at this wavelength, 10% of the light is missing. I mean, this is not a small thing. And yet, when I started my postdoc, not a single one of these, some 800 features, right, were actually identified with a, with a particular molecule. So what we would do is make the sorts of things we expect to see in space, the sorts of things that we know that are in space, and uh, none of these things that I measured during my, you see all these beautiful carbon chains, not a single one of them matched a diffuse interstellar band. So it was a, not a, I wouldn't call it an unsuccessful postdoc, lots of publications, but no identification with a diffuse band. But I did start an experiment when I was there, and we were inspired by uh, these, these people, they're, they're actually a married couple, and Pascal, she is now uh, head of the European Space Agency, actually. And they published this paper in uh, 97, which was not so long ago, um, when, when I was doing my postdoc. And in fact, so they found these, these diffuse bands, which they could compare to the spectrum of C60 plus. So that's this soccer ball of carbon with a single electron removed. And the spectrum of C60 plus had been measured in a cryogenic argon matrix by my boss at that time, John Meyer. And they looked, it looked not dissimilar to this, just to shift it a little bit. And so the race was on to produce the pure gas phase spectrum of buckyball cation. And so we started this experiment. Here are some notes sent to me recently by a German scientist who was involved in all of this. And there, there's the, uh, the picture of the instrument which, which we started to build. And I'll, I'll come back to that later. But this, this has become amusing. So this, you know, when you collaborate with, with the Germans, you have to have a site plan. You must be organized. And so, you know, he said, write me down a timetable. So I wrote it down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So four months after starting, I said, we would be drinking champagne by the Rhine. Didn't, got, didn't quite come to pass. I mean, we probably had drinks. But, you know. So more on that later. But just to summarize, my academic trajectory then started off at Roos. Incidentally, if you were here a few weeks ago at David Wharton's talk, anyone? David was uh, in, my, in my classes at, at school. We were exact contemporaries at, at James Roos. We were also at, at, at Sydney Uni together. I went to Cambridge, Basel, worked at CSIRO for a year, and uh, landed back in Sydney as an academic in 2004. I hand over to Scott again now. So in 2004, our paths converged yet again. So the rest of the story, I think, from 2004 to now, we're going to tell in science some of the scientific things that Tim and I work on. There's four sort of operations, four laboratories here. I put these up because they're simply beautiful photographs taken about six months ago in the lab and to show some of the people in the lab. And the way that our operation is, is structured is we call ourselves the Molecular Photonics Laboratories. There are three main groups in this lab. My expertise from my postdoc days is reaction dynamics. Photovoltaics is uh, uh, Tim's specialty. And this is both of our common love, this uh, molecular spectroscopy of radicals. And so today, on some of the collaborators that I think might be in the audience, of course, there's many dozens more around the world, but I haven't shown photographs here. And the story for today, we're going to try and get through four short vignettes from these projects. Moving from pure discovery with no application at all really intended through to a much more applied version of our science. So as you can see, I'm going to start off and we're going to inter ex exchange a couple of times. So chemistry, of course, is the science of breaking bonds and rearranging the atoms. Very simple molecule here. Reaction here simply to transfer a hydrogen atom from one carbon to another one. This reaction has been studied for 60 or 70 years. And the question that chemists ask is, how did it get there? How do you actually transform from a reactant to a product? What's the path that's taken? We can actually control the reactants. We can control them really well. So in the lab here, it's a photo of Kelvin. Uh, we use a molecular beam, which is sort of like a refrigerator. If you take a gas and you expand it, it cools. We cool these molecules to 10 Kelvin, still in the gas phase. And we use lasers to provide an exact energy. So we really control the reactants. 
And in the products, we measure high resolution spectra. We like to know everything that these products are doing. So this is a spectrum of a CO fragment. And each of these peaks here is a different amount of rotational energy in the molecule. You can think of this as a bar graph, right? So a molecule with 60 units of angular momentum is not very common. 50 is more common, 40 is more common. It's a bar graph of angular momentum. We can also measure how fast these fragments recoil. So if you initiate the reaction at a tiny little spot, they recoil out in a sphere. If you take that sphere and you splat it against the detector, you get rings. And the bigger the ring, the faster the fragment had to move. So we can interpret these uh, ion images here and work out how fast those fragments moved. In the end, if you put together the internal energy and the kinetic energy, you end up knowing everything that's possible pretty much about this reaction, a lot more detail that I don't have time to go into. Theoreticians are an important part of this. Is Meredith here? Hey, Meredith. There you are. Meredith is my theoretical colleague from University of Sydney. And uh, Meredith and other theoreticians are very good at calculating potential energy surfaces, which is our theoretical understanding of how you get from here to here. Uh, this concept of a transition state underpins chemistry. It's a saddle point. A saddle point mathematically is this intersection of two parabolas, one going up and one going down. Yeah, that's, that's mine. You take care of it. <laughs> and it's called a saddle for obvious reasons, right? It looks like a saddle. And saddles are everywhere. They're in geography as mountain passes. And in fact, this is an analogy chemists use a lot. This idea that you travel from a low energy region, you want to get to the other side of this mountain range. If you were a hiker, how would you do it? you'd go through the pass, wouldn't you? And a molecule does the same thing. It takes the lowest energy pathway to get from reactant to the other low energy side on the other side. And so let me give you an example of a transition state in this movie here. As the hydrogen atom gets passed from one carbon to the other, and this is the structure at that saddle point, which then continues down the other side, and the hydrogen atom has been transferred from one carbon to the other. You know, theoreticians are really very, very good at doing transition uh, at, at reactions that go over a transition state in all sorts of regards. The, the dots are here, some of our experimental data from about 10 years ago, and uh, Joel Bowman, with whom I was collaborating at the time, did these very extensive calculations to even get the quantum mechanical resonances right in these product state distributions. You don't take anything from this other than theorists can do transition state chemistry really, really well. So a long time ago, we started investigating the photochemistry of this molecule. Shine light on it, it breaks bonds, you measure these fragments. This was first done in 1960, right? And the proposed mechanism was this transition state mechanism. So there's the transition state, passes the hydrogen from one to the other, and then the two fragments come apart. And I did experiments, and the data I'm showing here actually go back to my postdoc days. Uh, and one of the take home lessons is to keep good notebooks and make sure you keep floppy disk drives that'll read eight and a half inch floppy disks to get the data. Uh, this was eventually published uh, 15 years later because we, the theoretical underpinning to explain the data were not there. If you do a transition state calculation, it's a much later calculation with much better theory and computers done by Kelvin and Meredith, it does not agree. Nowhere near as good as that previous one that I showed you. So I collaborated then with David Osborne at Sandia to measure the other fragment and the internal energy in the methane. How much is it vibrating? Well, transition state theory doesn't agree with that one either. So this reaction just doesn't look like it's a normal transition state reaction. Joel Bowman did a, it was about two years' work for one of his PhD students to do this movie, effectively, to show that this methyl group roamed around the outside and abstracted the hydrogen. It looked nothing like this. Very different chemical mechanism and none of the kinetics or thermodynamics that apply to the transition state apply to this roaming reaction. And I thought that experiment had, that had finished now. But what I didn't point out, oh, sorry, and here's the result of Joel's calculations, is a much better fit than it was before, although it turns out, in hindsight, that that bit that was missing is important. We left it alone, and then three or four other groups also studied this reaction and started to tell us that what we measured was wrong. Of course, you can't take that. So you send some students back into the lab and remeasure a different part of the reaction, this time measuring the speed of the fragments. So this is the kinetic energy of these two fragments, peaked at very low kinetic energy using the ion imaging technique. And there's the transition state calculation. We know that it doesn't work. But in collaboration with Joel and Meredith, there's yet another mechanism in here 
that gives rise to these products out here. Watch hydrogen number four here. It goes out, it tries to escape, it doesn't quite make it, and it comes up the backside of the CH3 group. It looks nothing like this at all. What that means is that all of the uh, theory for calculating this reaction just don't work, other than this very extensive theory of Joel, and there's his fit to the experimental data. It's not a fit, it's a, it's a standalone theoretical model. So these reactions called roaming now are starting to appear all through the literature. So before 2005, acid aldehyde, there was only two chemical pathways. In the last 10 years, there's now eight chemical pathways. It means that the chemistry is much more complicated than we ever get a credit for. Uh, and this is a pure discovery project, right? We're really trying to work out how chemical reactions occur. And before 10 years ago, 75% of the chemistry was missing. So the challenge in this part of, the, of, of my work is to actually challenge theoreticians and challenge chemical theory and come up with new theory. Romy has been found in more than 20 systems and these new theories are now being included in very complicated uh, reaction systems. So moving on to uh, story number two, this, is, uh, this all starts when I first uh, started up at the University of Sydney in 2004. And um, I don't have a whole lab program going, but my friend Rob Sharp, the astronomer, had uh, also moved to Australia. He's getting more and more Australian, but he still pronounces Coke as Cork. He's from uh, the up north somewhere in, in Britain. Um, and we knew that there was an object called the red rectangle, um, which is a, a protoplanetary nebula that exhibits emission features. So this is in the emission which seem to match up with the diffuse interstellar band spectrum which I mentioned earlier. So the diffuse interstellar band, nobody knows what they are, and nobody knew also what these were, but anything that emits light might be easier to study in the laboratory. So we thought, first of all, let's go and get some good astronomy done on the red rectangle. So there's Rob. Rob ran away to Chile, up a mountain to something called the VLT. The astronomers call things very literally. VLT stands for the Very Large Telescope. Right? It took him a long time to come back because the plane had to go to Tahiti, then he had to go diving, then it took like two weeks to get back. When we analyzed the spectra, we got very nice spectra of the unidentified red rectangle bands. And to our surprise, although maybe we shouldn't have been so surprised, but I, I liked it very much at the time, there was a little guy in this spectrum that we did understand, or at least we thought we did. This is a, an old friend of spectroscopists. This little guy here, is the C2 molecule. So we were the first people to find C2 in the red rectangle, and I thought, okay, C2, you're gonna tell me something about this object, right? This is the only object that shows these emission features. It's very special um, for various reasons. Now, this particular emission of the C2, <laughs> I was expecting it to crash, of the C2 molecule was actually first reported in 1802, and I'll show you a bit about that, but they're named the Swan Bands after William Swan, uh, who described them in 1857. But I should point out they were not identified as being due to C2 until 1930, right? So if we look at the 1802 paper of Wollaston, it, it's really quite neat, right? He, uh, the, the paper itself is all about the dispersive powers of various oils and things, and sperm whale oil, but he plays around just like any good experimentalist, and he disperses through a prism the spectrum of a flame. So this little blue thing at the bottom of the flame, and nowadays with proper propane burners and stuff, we could just take a whole blue flame and do this experiment. It's very nice. And when he examined uh, that spectrum alone, he found that this, that blue color is not different hues contiguous. Right. Beautiful language, isn't it? It was not a continuous spectrum, but rather what he saw were distinct images. And spectroscopically, that means that we had bands. And so if we get a modern spectrum, this is what he was seeing. He was seeing these bands, and we now know that these four are due to the C2 molecule. So C2 is in flames, C2 is in nebulae. Another nice thing about this paper was that he reported the Fraunhofer lines, which were then rediscovered by some German guy 20 years after that. C2, it turns out, is uh, pretty ubiquitous. You can't buy it it just turns into carbon, or you put it in the atmosphere, it'll burn up. But in space, in flames, it's everywhere. 
Um, these are absorption features in the interstellar medium, so C2 is there. If you look at comets, at least this part of the comet at the head, you see the swan bands of C2. That's really quite an exciting, I mean, these, these features dominate the spectrum of a comet. So if you like comets and measure, measuring spectra, you've got to like C2. So the C2 in the diffuse medium, we know there is C2 produced in the outflows of stars and the C2 in the heads of comets. But curiously, there's no C2 in the tail of a comet. So why is that? Well, to understand this, we need a comprehensive model of C2 photophysics. And so back in my early academic days, I started to look at this. And there's a lot of papers on C2, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And you start to look at papers just trying to describe theoretical modeling of this spectrum of a comet, in this case, Hale-Bopp, right? There's various transitions they take into account between all of these various electronic states. And you'll notice some of these have names and some of them just have designations, right? And uh, they talk about uncertainties involved in this modeling are significant. Basically, they don't know anything about this transition. And I thought to myself, okay, young academic, let's go. Let's sort this out. If you look at all of the uh, observed band systems, they're all named after people. There are two Nobel laureates in this list, uh, Hertzberg and Mulliken. These band systems are not there. Um, indeed, the D to C was, it was known from theory and from things called perturbations, but uh, never observed. And so I decided, well, we're going to do it. You know, let's be ambitious. Let's try something that no one else has been able to see before. And I had this elaborate scheme mapped out. I was going to pump C2 molecules. From, we know that we can make A state C2. I was going to pump them up to D. We know that some of it should relax to C. Then I was going to pump them out again and then look for the light coming back up. And Scott, I was talking to I was saying, telling Scott, I'm going to do this. He says, you might make some C state C2 in your discharge. Just try this. Just try that. And, and so we did. Scott was right. And out it came. And we discovered the D to C bands of C2. How, How long did that take? Well, after we told the lab what to do, 20 minutes. <laughs> but the trick is this. Normally, when you look for fluorescence, anything that normally fluoresces, you lose energy. So if you pump it in the red, you expect near-infrared light to come out. In this case, we got more energy coming out than we put in. But it's, it's not, it's not going to be an energy storage material. Don't get excited, PV people. OK. Publish this thing. Oh, we have to give this band system a name. They've all got names. But of course, it's pronounced duck, right? So, and it goes with swan. But the real inspiration for this was the duck and swan, which was our, our local pub at the time. Sadly, it's no longer called the duck and swan. It's just called the duck inn, but at least the duck is still there. Um, in the serious literature, we now have two band systems involving the C state, which are referred to as the Schmidt cable and cable Schmidt bands, but the duck does, does persist. This is, this is out of a recent publication. So you think, OK, so we now understand the D to C system. Can we model a comet? No. <laughs> this is our best model so far. And this is Comet de Vico, which I, it's unfortunately not, not a good picture. Um, what we consistently find is that when we try to model the C2 spectrum of a comet, the model gives us a much hotter spectrum than what is observed. And it occurred to me that while the the C2 molecules are born out of an ice. Comets are basically ice balls. And they evaporate molecules which then produce C2, not very hot. And then they start to warm up in front of the sun. And it occurred to me that maybe, maybe these molecules never actually reach an equilibrium with the sun. And so they're, they're basically destroyed on the way to heating up. And I tooled around with my model of C2 and found that, sure enough, if you heat it up to, for about two to three to 4,000 transitions, this is Comet de Vico, and I think you'll agree that somewhere around here, I'm going to get a very, very good match to that spectrum. So empirically, it's telling me that there is a missing photo dissociation mechanism of C2. C2 is being broken somehow. So we've got to look at this. Well, it turns out, and I found this out only a few months ago, Hertzberg thought of this. But Hertzberg's very smart and won the Nobel Prize, and we know that. But Hertzberg discovered this band system, A to E. It's called the Fox-Hertzberg uh, bands. And Hertzberg thought that if you excite from A to E high enough, you see the vertical transition will take you up here, it'll be able to rattle out and cross over onto the D state here and photo dissociate. And actually, he proposed that as an explanation for why you don't see C2 in the tail of a comet, but you do in the head. 
Well, nobody has seen the dissociative part of this. So I sent people into the lab. It took more than 20 minutes. The following is actually very hard spectroscopy. So we did a different sort of spectroscopy here. Instead of uh, fluorescent spectroscopy, what we did is we, we used uh, two lasers, two photons to ionize through a resonance state. And once we've got ions, we accelerate them in a mass spectrometer and measure the mass. And so we scan this laser uh, and monitor the signal on mass 24, which is, is the C2. And we found a new spectrum. And so that's great. But what's the lowest state? I mean, we've got a spectrum now. What do we do? In fact, we were seeing CO produced in our experiment in its uh, 20th vibrational level. I mean, this is extremely hot. This could be anything. Um, so we did something called double resonance spectroscopy, and the following was performed by Olha, who is, is sitting in the audience. Um, this shouldn't have appeared. So we have data, now what? And so what she did is she tried to remove population from the ground state by pumping through the swan bands, the A to D system, and then probing. And when she hits a transition which shares the ground state here, you get a dip. And, you know, she got no signal on vehicle zero, nothing on one, nothing on two. It's like, is it even going to work? And then something on three. Amazing. Never give up. So that allowed us to assign. So that now appears. We assign. We simulate 50 Kelvin spectrum. And now we've discovered yet another band system of C2. And we're pretty excited. This is ongoing work, but we think that we have probably uncovered the, the mechanism for the photo dissociation of C2, which will then explain the spectrum of comets. All right. So, I mean, that's all lovely. Whatever happened to my C60 plus experiment? I left it in Basel. Four months went past. Eventually, I left. There was no champagne. But I was pretty happy to see uh, my old boss and Dieter uh, reported this in a little magazine called Nature just in July this year. So this is great closure, and actually a really bittersweet moment for Harry Croto, who discovered C60. So Harry Croto discovered C60 because he believed he could make interstellar molecules by vaporizing carbon. He discovered C60, he then invented a whole field of nanotechnology, and now and it's known... won a Nobel Prize. Oh, he got a Nobel yeah. Prize, we know, everyone knows that. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, Unfortunately, he's, he's, he's now suffering from Lou Gehrig's disease, doesn't have much time. So this is a, 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 love, a lovely thing to have happened. So now we know that the C60 in space, John can smoke cigars for the rest of his life. And I uh, got this nice email from Dieter, who, you know, concedes that it was a long wait. <laughs> Not four months, but 13 years, but in the end, it was good. And the moral of this story is, you never give up. Tim and I have a theory that uh, John Meyer might well be getting an invitation to Sweden over this. We will see about that. At the very least, I think the Queen should put a sword on him. <laughs> it's a very impressive piece of work. Uh, moving to some more applied part of our science, and I'll try and, I'm aware of the time, we're a little late coming in, so I'll try and speed up a little bit. This is Beijing on Victory Day, Victory Over Japan 70 years ago, so the 70th anniversary of the Victory Over Japan Day. Beautiful photo of Beijing, isn't it? One day later, it looks like this. Okay, so the government had shut down all of the factories for a week beforehand to clean the air up so they could have a beautiful victory day. And then industry starts up again, and this is what the air pollution looks like. Yeah, air pollution is responsible for about three million deaths per year. It's a very significant cause of human mortality. And this, these are the flashpoints you can see. China and India with a lot of its industry. Australia and New Zealand, very clean down here as a role for atmospheric chemistry because of the Cleanliness, you can actually see Sydney and Melbourne have a bit of a green dot there as well. Atmospheric chemistry is a long-standing science, and when you understand the chemistry, you can actually do something to fix this up. So this is in the US, uh, measuring the amount of nitrogen dioxide, which is another pollutant in the atmosphere, in 2005, averaged over the whole summer. The chemistry of nitrogen dioxide is really well understood. And if the chemistry is well understood, you can make good public policy that way, and you can do things like put catalytic converters onto cars and clean the air up, shut down dirty coal-fired power stations, and get this result here six years later, which is a significant improvement. But of course, air pollution is much more than just oxides of nitrogen pollution. I was at a talk just last week, and Gabe De Silva from the University of Melbourne is an atmospheric modeler. He was in the audience, and I stole this slide straight from him, with permission, but straight from him. This is, as a modeler, what he thinks are the core deficiencies in atmospheric, atmospheric models at the moment. And let me tell you why. Aerosols are the big unknown of atmospheric chemistry. 
right? We don't know where they come from, unless you own a VW, then we know where they come from. Uh, how are they formed? They also are aggregated of organic molecules. Nobody knows that chemistry. What's the consequences? There's some theories in the literature that aerosols of a certain size will have a similar effect to what asbestos does. What's their impact on climate change? Aerosols scatter light to space, so they cool the Earth, but they absorb infrared, so they warm the Earth. That's really hard to calculate. Organic acids, uh, inorganic acids are really well known, and they've been scrubbed out of smokestacks for 50 years, but organic acids are not well known. The models only get it right in a factor of two. That's nowhere near good enough. No one knows where the acid comes from. And this little guy called OH, a little diatomic molecule, is the absolute scavenger. Every organic thing in the atmosphere reacts with OH. Yet we don't understand it. The models get the concentration of OH wrong, especially in areas of high organic load. It's a catalyst. So small errors in OH make large errors in rates and in fates of molecules. So if you can't get OH right, uh, some of the models in different environments struggle to actually predict what's observed. And the story I'll tell you is about organic acids. This is a story that led directly on from the roaming experiment that I was telling you about 10 minutes ago. Uh, Duncan was an honor student, and I gave him an experiment that I knew would work. We would take acid aldehyde and put a deuterium on there, something chemists like to do, just to measure the roaming reaction. But what he and Brianna saw in breaking the CC bond is 75% give that, but 25% actually give things that are not intuitively obvious. We need to swap a black and a blue ball on here before breaking the ball. And how do you do that? So this is a extensive calculation. Again, solving this problem with Meredith took a year and a half, something like that. The movie speeds up because it takes so long. You need some Benny Hill music around. We're exchanging hydrogen atoms across the molecule here. So the uh, blue one went across, but the white one came back. Keep going. And finally, we get back to the same molecule in just a second. But we've swapped a blue and a white ball. This is the predominant. 90% of that flux goes through this pathway, as complicated as it is. The story, though, is in recognizing in that pathway the very first step. So this is the first step repeated. Forgive my clumsy uh, PowerPoint there. This is vinyl alcohol. This is, to the chemist, this is a tautomerization from uh, the keto form to the enol form. Vinyl alcohol doesn't really appear in atmospheric chemists, uh, uh, atmospheric models, but Meredith and I predicted this would actually be really important in atmospheric chemistry. We predicted vinyl alcohol be formed, and Gabe De Silva had actually published the uh, likely atmospheric mechanism of vinyl alcohol, which goes through this pathway, and all you need to look at here is organic acids are formed from this vinyl alcohol. We then measured the wavelength dependence and the pressure dependence and all the things you have to do to put into an atmospheric model, but that doesn't prove that it means anything. So you uh, contact your favorite atmospheric modelers from the University of Leeds that have one of the world's most extensive atmospheric model, and they calculate the amount of formic acid produced under London conditions with thousands and thousands of reactions in here, and they get the blue curve. The oscillation is the day-night oscillation. This is calculated over a couple of weeks. If you put that one extra reaction in, you double the amount of formic acid. And the atmospheric models, if you remember back, were wrong by about a factor of two. So this does it exactly the right way. If you go into pristine environments, it's actually a factor of three, uh, uh, produced more strongly by factor of three. These numbers are smaller, though, over here. So we actually think we've solved this, one of those three problems that, uh, uh, that I showed you early on, the amount of acids in the atmosphere. So for these three problems, we're sort of tackling all three now. Tim and I had a grant funded this year. Callan Wilcox and Olha are working on trying to get to very earliest chemical pathways in the formation of aerosols. Meredith and I have a grant under review at the moment. In there, we have a hypothesis of what happens to OH. Uh, if it works, you know, this will be, I, I hope, stunning. And the story I just told you now, of course, on the acids, where we hypothesize that phototautomerization is actually responsible for all of the organic acids in the atmosphere. All right, mindful of the time, I'm going to run through this very quickly. Um, apologies to the, uh, Darren, I mean, you've been waiting for this, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, as you know, I mean, I'm a molecular spectroscopist, but being in the right place at the right time sometimes brings new opportunities. And when I was at the University of Sydney, 
Um, I, I had as a colleague uh, for a little while Ned Eakins Dorks, uh, who's skiing with me here at the top of some mountain in, in Austria. I'm the only guy wearing a Hawaiian shirt. I, it's perfect for skiing. Uh, at least one of you in the audience knows Piers Barnes as well, who, who's in this picture, who uh, won an Ig Nobel Prize. Um, and Ned uh, and Gavin Conybeer, who's in the audience, yes, Gavin and I, I don't know what it is about, uh, what is it with skiing? I, we're always at conferences, serious conferences, Ian, very serious. Um, so Ned and Ian, <laughs> Ned and uh, Gavin uh, were collaborating a little bit at that time on something called third generation photovoltaics, which uh, tries to circumvent limits of standard solar cells. And we had to sit down and these guys asked me whether a molecule could do a certain job. And I said to them, well, you probably want to have a triplet state. You want to do this, this, and this. It started a, a whole research program. So the background is that there's, there's a, a very famous limit in photovoltaics called the shockley kweiser limit, which basically says that a standard solar cell, which has got a single band gap, can only be about 30% efficient. If you change the solar spectrum and tweak it, this goes to like 33% or something. But basically, it's 30%. Silicon has a band gap, which limits it to about 29 or something. But nevertheless, that's the limit. If you want to go higher than that, you've got to do something tricky. Now, the reasons for having a limit, or this is, this is out of order, I'm sorry. The reason for having uh, that, that limit is that if you, if you have a, a very big band gap, you can generate a high voltage, but you miss out on most of the spectrum. So this is the so-called below band gap loss. And it, it's the elephant in the room here, right? If you go to a very low band gap, you absorb the entire solar spectrum, you can generate a high current, but you have essentially no voltage. And so the trade-off for a single threshold is here at about 1.3 EV, and gallium arsenide cells are in fact very good. If you can do something about this, if you can capture this unabsorbed light and turn it into something that the solar cell can use, we go back to this slide, then you can go, you have a different curve. And so you see for a range of band gaps, 1.5 to 2 EV or so, right, theoretically, you, you can have quite a, a high efficiency. And moreover, for high band gap cells, you've got a lot to gain by somehow converting low energy light to higher energy light. And we do this through a process called up conversion. And that's what I'm going to talk about for five or 10 minutes. So to boost the efficiency of a single threshold solar cell, um, one can do various things, right? We, we can try to split photons in two, uh, and, and there are projects at this university uh, seeking to, to do just that. Hot carrier cell project is something Gavin's working on. Or you can try to use the low energy photons, and up conversion is, is what we do in, in my group. And we tackle it using molecules, using a process known as photochemical up conversion. And the way that that proceeds, it's gonna be techy and complicated, but we absorb low energy photons and then we lock that energy away by crossing from a so-called singlet state to a triplet state. That energy is transferred to a different sort of molecule. And you do that twice and interact these two triplets, then you can put one of them up here. And then that comes, then you get a higher energy photon coming out. And this is actually reasonably easy to do. And so here we're, you see we're turning red into gold, which almost sounds al alchemical, right? You can imagine all sorts of applications of this, right? From photovoltaics to drug activation inside the body, biological imaging, solar fuels, low voltage lighting and water detoxification. There are a whole bunch of applications if you can turn lower energy light into higher energy light. And it's extremely, using molecules, very versatile spectroscopically, right? We can, we can make blue light from red, we can make blue light from green, yellow light from red. Now my uh, early contribution to this field was to debunk a myth that was stopping people using this, uh, this technology in research. And the reason is that when two triplets meet, so a triplet state is so called because it comes in three flavors. And when you bring these three together and another three, you get nine, right? You get nine different combinations. And mathematics is beautiful, right? Mathematics tells us that there's five quintet states. There's three triplets and only one singlet out of that. One plus three plus five equals nine. And so there was a prevailing rumor, right, that the limiting efficiency, and this is published in JAX, which is in chemistry is regarded as a very good magazine, right? That the math theoretical maximum is 11.1%. 
right? Because of this one ninth. Now, I thought, this is crazy, right? This doesn't make sense to me. If you think about it, if you have, I've got here 18 reaction partners, one comes through and uh, we'll, make, we'll make a photon. Th this is a single pathway. What happens to triplet encounters? Well, they could quench, and at most, I would say, if that channel is open, you will lose half of them, right, for various reasons. And the quintet state, a molecular spectroscopist knows that the quintet state will not react, that the quintet channel will not react. But the only way, I mean, you can say this to people, the only way that people will really accept that there's no 11% limit is if you smash it. And so we did an experiment. I thought, well, let's just drive this. And so here's the experiment. We have a red laser beam igniting this yellow light. Right? This is unusual, right? You don't normally see yellow light coming out of uh, red excitation. We can, we can actually look, look at the, the, the time signature of that. So this is occurring over a microsecond time scale. And those laser pulses that ignite the system there are actually only about 100 femtoseconds long, right? If you, if you just uh, excite the emitter molecules, then the fluorescence is over in nanoseconds. But, but this, is, this is the triplet-triplet annihilation pathway. And using various experimental conditions, we're able to show that you easily smash, easily smash uh, the, the one ninth. And uh, you, here you can get more than 30%. And on this scale, uh, now, the, the most recent report from this year, people have got up to 86%. So there's, there's really no in principle reason that you can't use every photon that you put into a, an, a, a photochemical up converter, right? The quantum yield of this, by the way, is 43% because you're using two photons to produce one, one higher one. We're also the only group that's applied this directly to photovoltaics, and the way that you do that is you take a, a semi-transparent solar cell, which is transmitting light below the band gap. You contact an up conversion medium with a, with a suitable back reflector, and then you have to couple the light back in. These experiments are, are pretty technically challenging, but I'll just, I'll just show you some, some spectra quickly. There's, there's the mechanism. These are the actual molecules that we use. This beast uh, was produced by my former colleague, I guess he's maybe still my colleague, but he's at the University of Sydney. I don't know if I'm allowed to call him a colleague anymore. <laughs> that's made by Max Crosley's group. And uh, the emitter we use is rubrine, which actually you can get commercially in kilogram quantities because it's used in uh, light sticks for rave parties. But these two go well together. Rubrine emission fits into an, an absorption window in the, in the porphyrin absorption. And um, this absorption spectrum of the porphyrin, we match to a couple of solar cells. These are, these are basically types of plastic solar cell which transmit red light. And so we did experiments on these cells, that which, which we acquired from KIT, that's in Karlsruhe, and we measured the ratio of the quantum efficiency of the solar cells with and without the up converter, and we get these uh, efficiency ratio curves. We see we get, we get a huge gain, relative gain of efficiency in, in the red region due to the up conversion. But this is a relative gain of something that's very small. So we, we actually encourage the literature to quote something else where we say, well, tell us what will be the current gain under one sun illumination, right? And then what we do is we, we try to improve that. And so uh, way back before 2012, people had only uh, dealt with, with, with amorphous silicon solar cells that only used a rare earth up conversion, and they were getting current gains way down here, like 10 to the minus 6 milliamps. It's like nanoamps. That's nanoscience, right? So our very first attempt to use photochemical up conversion uh, with, with the same sorts of solar cells, absolutely smashed this. Um, and then we've improved this steadily. Um, but those of you who, who know what this scale really means know that we're still under 10 to the, where are we here? Minus two. That's a minus three, yeah. We're way down here uh, on a milliamp scale. And we want to be up here. We want to be producing milliamps per square centimeter under one sun. So we need to find a couple of orders of magnitude improvement, and that's what we're doing in my lab right now. So we reckon we can squeeze another factor of two by getting better solar cells. Um, we can broaden our dye absorption spectrum, maybe get a factor of five out of that, because at the moment we've only got a single molecule in there. And uh, well, the actual efficiency of the upconversion process we want to improve as well, and we've got strategies towards that. But there's one, one more figure to put on here. And that's our latest result. This paper only got accepted maybe two days ago. So we're, we're right here. So that's the state of the art. Now, I'm kind of optimistic that, that we can keep pushing this up with lots of little tricks. 
but I feel like we're becoming engineers. I don't know if that's a bad thing. <laughs> um, so that's, the, that's our little solar energy story from the lab. So I'll just, uh, I'll just summarize uh, what, what we've told you about today. So the four stories, which range from, I mean, these are really just pure discovery, proje discovery type uh, projects. You know, I mean, I'm never going to apply C2 to anything, but I kind of like the idea of comets. And uh, right through to the more applied end uh, with up conversion or drug activation or, or whatever. And I'll just click through. These are, since 2005, Scott and I have uh, taken photos of a combined group. And I'll just point out George Baxke, who's been a, a, a colleague that's worked with us for many years uh, doing theory. He now is turned into a hippie, lives in the Sunshine Coast hinterland. But because he's a theoretician, he can still work with us using his computer. Uh, the group gets bigger and bigger. And uh, this is the latest photo here of our group retreat down at uh, Jarvis Bay. Is there anything you want to say, Scott? Yeah, there's just a final wrap-up slide reminding you what the theme of this uh, talk was, the intertwining of family and science, spanning 500 years of family with our common ancestor, 20 years of science since uh, Tim was an undergraduate at Sydney Uni. Uh, our ancestors drank together, presumably. That trend continues in the family. Yours gave money to mine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we started doing some science early on together. Uh, we do some wonderful science. I mean, I think C2 is probably the thing we're most personally proud of. It's the most esoteric of all the stuff we do. And uh, an acknowledgement to uh, all of the group that we currently have. And thank you all for listening. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Peter Lovelbond, I'm Deputy Dean of the uh, Faculty of Science and it's my pleasure to say a few words of thanks to Scott and Tim uh, this evening. We've just had the, uh, the privilege, is this working, can you hear me okay or I'm talking loud enough, okay. We just had the privilege of uh, hearing a presentation uh, by two scholars with international reputations and as we've heard international connections who are at the very top of their game. And I think it'll be clear to everyone here why we were so keen to recruit them to uh, UNSW. As I'm not a physical chemist myself, I did a little background research last night on Scott and Tim before today's talk, not their genealogy, but I wanted to share with you some of what I found. And bear in mind, I didn't have the benefit of this afternoon's talk, so try and imagine what it felt like at 10 o'clock last night. So the first paper I looked at was one of Tim's. Um, in the Journal of Physical Chemistry, and I read about some spectroscopic calculations he'd performed at the multi-reference configuration interaction level of theory with Davidson correction with covalence correlation obtained with quadruple zeta basis. So I move straight on to Scott's publication <laughs> list, which, which described the phototautomerization of acetaldehyde to vinyl alcohol, implying that photolysis of small aldehydes and ketones could provide tropospheric sources of enol sufficient to impact organic acid budgets. So I understood alcohol and budget <laughs> in, in that one. So really, what my pre-reading tells us, of course, is just how good a job Scott and Tim have done this afternoon in translating their highly technical research into terms that we can all understand. They're fantastic science communicators, and communication of our research is critical to the university, because if we can explain to the wider community what we've found and why it's important, then uh, we may be able to persuade politicians that there are votes in it and we can, they can better fund our research and our teaching. So Scott and Tim made their work very accessible to us all today. They took us on a journey from basic laboratory science to the structure of matter in our universe. As uh, I think uh, Tim mentioned, diatomic carbon C2 is a gas that only exists at 3,500 degrees, so it's obviously hard to study, which I presume is what the lasers are doing. Um, and it's hard to study out there in interstellar space. But it can be studied through sp uh, spectroscopy. And, and Scott and Tim described the remarkable level of uh, insight their methods, combined with mathematical models, have provided into the chemistry of gases in space and in the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, and they also told us how spectroscopy can be harnessed to understand and optimise the chemical reactions in converting sunlight into electrical energy. And of course, we all love it when uh, conventional wisdom is overturned, uh, when you broke that 11% uh, barrier and when a new theory makes predictions that actually turn out to be right. 
This is classic science at the highest level, and it's wonderful to see that a branch of science as old as chemistry is still revealing new secrets. Some of you will know that the School of Chemistry at UNSW is itself quite old. Uh, it can trace its roots back to the Sydney Mechanical School of Arts in 1833, more than a century before UNSW became a university. So if my timing's right, if I have the dates right, when your ancestors were selling alcohol to each other, <laughs> your intellectual forebears, forebears, I beg your pardon, uh, forebears might be more <laughs> appropriate, um, were trying to understand the chemistry, perhaps of alcohol, in the School of Arts. I think that's a wonderful thought. Um, so Scott and Tim, thank you so much for your erudite and entertaining presentation this afternoon. It really has been most impressive. We are delighted that you've come to UNSW and we look forward to working with you uh, for many years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. We, we've been treated to a, a truly wonderful and memorable lecture this evening, which has, has you, you've, you really have risen to exactly the remit we wanted and expected from these inaugural lectures, a combination of um, history, family, fun, um, brilliant science. We've, we've had some, some truly great science. I wonder what um, Henry and Susanna Cable would have made of that. They would probably have understood it about as much as most of the people in the audience because you explained it so, so brilliantly. Um, but we, we really have had great science, um, great stories, family, friendship, collaboration, and application. We've seen how some of this brilliant science can be applied. And of course, in the midst of all that, we've seen great fun as well. It really has been a wonderfully memorable lecture. In a moment, I'm going to invite you all to, to stay for a little while for drinks and nibbles to, to celebrate this great lecture and to network, because that's the other aim of this lecture. I want to finish off by asking Tim and Scott to come to the middle of the room and give you a chance to give them one last really rousing round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you.